Today, in Galatians chapter 5, we are going to learn about Christian freedom from the law, loving others, and walking in the Holy Spirit. So with this as a background, let us begin in prayer. Let us bow for prayer. Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, we thank you for this time to come before you and hear your word and to have the word pierce our heart so that we can be changed evermore. Father, we pray that you would clear our minds of all distractions. May your word speak to our hearts and spirit. May my words be few so that your words may be many. Holy Spirit, guide us and help us to understand and to apply your word. Illuminate our feeble minds so we may receive your infallible and inerrant word. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So the first week, the sermon was entitled Grace Alone. The second week, it was titled In Christ Alone. The third week was entitled In uh, Faith Alone. And then last week was Scripture Alone. Today's message is entitled Christian Freedom. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to open to Galatians chapter 5 and stand with me, if you're able to, in reading of God's Word. Hear the Word of of the Lord. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You are running well. Who who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who would unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For you were called the freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. 
If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. This is the inerrant, infallible word of God. You may be seated. There's a couple of classic verses in here, and we'll spend a little time with those verses. This text teaches us that because Jesus Christ has set us free, we are, number one, to not submit to a yoke of slavery. Number two, we are to love our, oursel- love our neighbors as ourselves. And number three, we are to walk by the Spirit. No yoke of slavery, love our neighbor and walk by the Spirit. First point, because Christ has set us free, number one, we are to not submit ourselves to a yoke of slavery. No yoke of slavery. In verse 1, we're told that Jesus Christ has set us free. So the natural question is, what has he set us free from? We are free from a yoke of slavery. We're free from the curse of the law. We're free from the curse of Adam. We are free from spiritual death. We are uh, free from the fear of death. We are free from condemnation. We are free from the power of sin. We are free from the authority of Satan. We are free to inherit all that Christ has purchased for us. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. We do not make ourselves free. It is Christ. Christian freedom is a gift from Jesus, given to us and received by faith alone in Christ alone. If this freedom were lost, the whole gospel would be lost. We are to stand firm against the slavery of law, and to cherish our freedom knowing that grace and riches at Christ's expense covers our failures because Christ has set us free. Do not submit again to yoke of slavery refers to the yoke of the law. The Jews had 613 commandments that they had to keep in keeping up with the law of Moses. The Jews themselves were not able to justify themselves before God by the law, so therefore they should not have put that heavy yoke on the Gentiles, the Galatians here, either. Notice that Paul uses the word again. Do not submit again in this verse. The Gentile Christians of Galatia were once enslaved to pagan gods and false religions. And Paul is warning the Galatians not to allow the Jewish legalists to enslave them all over again, but this time with the law and the requirement of circumcision. In verse 2, Paul testifies that if the Galatians were to accept the Jewish legalists' demand and believe circumcision as a requirement of what must be done for salvation, the cross will be rendered useless to save. If one believes the law, circumcision, done for the purpose of self-justification is salvific, that nullifies all the advantages of Christ and puts the person back into the slavery to the law again. There are three consequences of being enslaved to the law. The first consequence you'll see in this verse is that Christ will be no advantage to you. Recall two men died on the cross with Jesus. For the one who put his trust in Jesus, he received eternal life. For the one who trusted in himself, he did not receive eternal life. 
In verse 3, we see the second consequence of being enslaved to the law. The second consequence is that the individual is obligated to keep the whole law, which cannot be kept. By being enslaved to the law, Jesus is no longer your righteousness, and you're attempting to earn salvation on your own. If you come to Jesus on the basis of your own law-keeping, your law-keeping must be perfect. No amount of obedience makes up for one act of disobedience. You'll recall the illustration that I provided a few weeks ago that if you're pulled over for speeding, and of, and of course I'm not speaking of my own experience, it will do you no good by protesting that you were not swerving, you weren't drunk, you may have obeyed the speed limits many times in the past, all of that is irrelevant. You've still broken the speeding law and you are guilty under it. John Calvin says the legalists among the Galatians wanted them to think that they could have both Jesus and a law relationship with God. Paul tells them this is not an option open to them. The system of grace and the system of law are incompatible. Whoever wants to have a half Christ loses the whole. In verse 4, we see the third consequence of being enslaved to the law. You'll see in this verse, you're severed from Christ. A spiritual decapitation. To be enslaved to the law means you believe Jesus Christ and his death for your sins was not enough. Brothers and sisters, Jesus plus something is nothing. If you add anything to Jesus, it is just a gateway into legalism. If you believe that you can earn your salvation, then you, would, you have abandoned the doctrine of grace. Jesus plus nothing is everything. In verse 5, Paul answers the question of how we receive Christian freedom through the great Three, Christian, three great Christian values, faith, hope, and love. We eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness, assurance not based on our personal or self-righteousness, but the hope of righteousness, the assurance based on the God-man, Jesus Christ, who perfectly fulfilled the law so we may receive his righteousness. In the next verse, the, cre the Christian freedom express, expresses itself in love. In verse 6, we live by faith alone, in Christ alone, working through love. When we see how much God has loved us and how much he gave for us, our faith is stirred up in our hearts, resulting in an abiding trust in Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. If your faith doesn't work through love, it isn't real faith. When Christ returns, it will not be about circumcision or uncircumcision, religious rules or keeping the rules. When Christ returns, the only thing that will matter will be our right standing before God. And that works through faith, working through love. We should be known for our radical Christ-like love, not our moralism. There's a story told of a man who went to the slave market and bought a slave in 1865. He selected a young girl and bought her. When she came to meet him, the man smiled and he said, you are free. I paid the price for you, and now I choose to set you free. The young girl couldn't believe her ears. She said, free to do whatever I want? She asked wide-eyed. Yes, free to do what you want. Free to say whatever I want? And he replied, yes, 
free to say whatever you want. She said, free to go wherever I want? She asked with tears in her eyes. Yes, free to go wherever you want, he said, trying to hold back his own tears. She stared at him for a minute and finally grabbed his hand and said, it's decided then, I will go with you. Likewise, because of the person and work of Jesus Christ, we are set free from the law because grace has redeemed us once and for all. And we should decide to go with Jesus. Amen. In verse 7, the Jewish legalists were interfering with the Galatians' well-ran spiritual race. The Galatians had a good start in their faith in Jesus, but it isn't enough to start well if you don't continue to run the race to the finish, placing your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. In verse 8, the false gospel of works-based righteousness came from the Judaizers and not from the one who calls the elect. We know from our previous study of Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, the one who called the elect is God through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, we need to be able to distinguish the hiss of legalism from the serpent from the whispers of grace from God. In verse 9, Paul quotes the proverb, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Leaven is the ingredient which makes a bread rise. You could think of it as yeast. And a little leaven can corrupt the whole lump. Likewise, even a small amount of sin, false doctrine, or legalism spoils the body of Christ the grace, and the finished work of Christ. I remember reading about a father whose children were pestering him about watching a movie. They said, the movie only has a, a little cussing, nudity, and bad stuff. Come on, Dad, it's just a little. The next day, the dad made brownies and offered them to the kids. He said, I want you to know that these brownies are 99% good. I just put a little of dog's poop in it, but it's just a little. The kids got the lesson. The question is, will we? In verse 10, Paul has confidence in the Lord, not confidence in the Galatians. Confidence in the Lord in keeping the Galatians from taking up the Judaizers false gospel and that the false teachers will bear the penalty of a heavy judgment from God for teaching a false gospel. Assurance for the saint and the reckoning for the wretched. In verse 11, the Judaizers were falsely telling the Galatians that Paul agreed with the necessity of circumcision for salvation. The Judaizers were saying, see, look, look at Paul. He's a Jew. He's circumcised. And Paul is with us because he also circumcised Timothy. However, Acts chapter 16 teaches us that Timothy was already a believer when Paul circumcised him. Timothy had a Greek father and a Jewish mother. So in order for him to go to the synagogues with Paul to evangelize among unsaved Jewish people, Timothy needed to be circumcised. John Stott summarized these verses by saying, Circumcision stands for a religion of human achievement, of what man can do by his now good works. Christ stands for divine achievement of what God has done through the finished work of Christ. Circumcision means law, works, and bondage. Christ means grace, faith, and freedom. Every man and woman must choose 
The one impossibility is what the Galatians were attempting, namely to add circumcision to Christ and have both. No, circumcision and Christ are mutually exclusive. Brothers and sisters, the offense of the cross is that there's nothing you or I can do to earn our salvation. Zero. Living a good life by religious rule keeping cannot save you. You and I cannot say we are saved because I did this or that. You can only say I got saved because Jesus did everything and it is finished. Amen. And we are the recipients of his free gift of salvation. In verse 12, Paul wishes the false teachers would emasculate themselves. I'm not saying that this is in the word of God here. For robbing the Galatians from the greatness of the gospel. The Judaizers were so fascinated with the snipping of foreskins. Paul is saying, why stop there? Paul wished the Judaizers who demanded circumcision would amputate their own genitalia altogether and not merely the foreskins. In the region of Galatia, there were a no number of pagan gods, and one of them was named Cybele. And in order to be a priest in that temple, you had to be castrated. Paul is saying, if you want to make circumcision a prerequisite for salvation, you are doing the same as the priests of Cybele, and you might as well go ahead and castrate yourself. Legalism takes away our Christian freedom and focuses us on things that are irrelevant for salvation. Second point, because Jesus Christ set us free we are to love our neighbors. Love. In verse 13, Paul taught the Galatians that they should use, but not abuse, their Christian freedom. Christian freedom, again, is freedom from the law, freedom from condemnation, freedom from rules and regulations. But freedom does not mean you can do what Jesus has set you free from. Although the Christians are not under the law, this does not mean that Christians are lawless and are to live self-indulgent, fleshly, self-centered life of licentiousness. We are not free to commit sins. Freedom is not rebellion. Freedom is not the ability to follow whatever your heart desires. What makes... What makes you think that Jesus, by his precious blood, purchased, purchased your freedom so that you could spend your freedom on a self-indulgent lifestyle? Instead, with our Christian freedom, by faith, we are to serve one another through love. You're blessed with freedom, so now use your freedom to bless others. Gratitude for the gospel doesn't birth rebellion. It births a heart that responds in gratitude to the great love of God for us. In verse 14, Paul teaches the reason for serving one another in love. The reason is because the whole law, all 613 commandments, is fulfilled in you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul is quoting Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 which says do not seek revenge or bear grudge against anyone among your people but love your neighbor as yourself. We are called and equipped to love one another. Romans chapter 13 verses 8 to 10 says let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt of love to one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the laws. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And what other commandment 
there may be, are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of law. In verse 15, Paul provides a warning. If you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. This warning here provides a vivid picture of wild animals biting its prey, tearing at its flesh, and then consuming all of it. This is the consequence of legalism. False teaching never unites true brethren. It divides. False teaching brings a self-righteous, judgmental spirit. Legalism fosters a critical eye without love for one another, resulting in a concern only for oneself, no matter what the cost to other people. Selfish people will eventually be consumed by one another, turning the church into a congregation of spiritual cannibals. Instead, as Christians, we need to be known for love towards one another. And then the third and, la and last point, because Jesus Christ has set us free, we are to walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. In verse 16, we are taught how to live the Christian life. We are to walk by the Spirit, by the power leading guidance of the Holy Spirit who lives within us so that we will not gratify the innate desires of the flesh. In this verse, Paul gives us one of the best promises found anywhere in the Bible that if we walk by the Spirit, a constant and consistent step-by-step -step submitting ourselves to the Spirit, we will not gratify the desires or lusts of the flesh. Every believer has the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is who gives us life. We must live by and be governed by and be open and sensitive to the counsel, the comfort, conviction of the Holy Spirit regarding our decisions concerns and problems in our lives because the desires of the flesh are still there even when we are in Christ and have been justified. We must walk by the Spirit because of God's impossible standards of holiness, because the flesh is powerful and ever-present, and because of the relentless operation of Satan's temptations. In verses 17 and 18, we're told there are two natures. The nature of the flesh, which is the physical fallenness, our efforts, our weaknesses that we were born with. And then secondly, the nature of the spirit, what you were born again with, that are at constant war with each other and each Christian. The flesh, the flesh exists in our fallenness setting its desires against the Holy Spirit who is in us. If you are led by the internal compulsions of the Holy Spirit, you are not controlled by the constraint of the law, and the result is life. Walking by the Spirit is the same as walking by the Word of God. The Word reflects the will of the Spirit. In contrast, if you are led by the law, you are not under the Spirit, and the result is death. So how do we know if we are led by the Spirit or led by the law? Verses 19, and 20, 19 to 23 are the diagnostic tools for living by the Spirit or by the law. So let's look at those. In verses 19 to 21... Paul catalogs the 18 works of the flesh, which are outwardly evident, obviously belonging to the sinful nature, which of course are the opposite of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The 18 works of flesh 
can be divided into three categories. Number one, sexual sins. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. Number two, religious sins. Idolatry and sorcery. And three, social sins. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, and orgies. Of course, these examples of the flesh are not an exhaustive list. As a child of God, who one day will be around the holy throne of God, you think you should be engaging in these fleshly activities? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. That which a person sows, they shall also reap. In the rest of verse 21, Paul warns that those that are characterized by the works of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's be honest. We, I, see myself in this list. However, that does not mean that if you've ever lost your temper or lusted or got jealous that you are going to hell. No, the idea isn't that a Christian could never occasionally commit these sins, but that the Christian could never stay in these sins. When Paul says those who do such things, Paul means people who are living a lifestyle defined by these acts, a habitual continuation of life in these sins. A lifestyle defined by the flesh is visible proof that the Holy Spirit is not in your life, and you do not belong to Christ Jesus, and you have not crucified the flesh. In verses 22 and 23, we see what it is like to walk by the Spirit, examples of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in this most well-known Bible verse. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. This is what the free life, the spirit-filled life, really looks like. This is the life that we were called to. This is the life that we have been set free to pursue in Christ. This is the life the Holy Spirit produces in us. This is the life of integrated virtue. This is the life that is the antidote to the conceited provocation and envy that we see in verse 26. This is the life that protects the church from pride and division. Note that the fruit of the Spirit, fruit, is singular which is in contrast to the works, plural, of the flesh. There is only one fruit of the Spirit that yields these nine virtues. All the work of the Spirit, all the characteristics of Jesus Christ. Fruit grows naturally when you abide in the vine, Jesus Christ, when you yield to the Holy Spirit. John Scott Stott a theologian categorizes love, joy, and peace as our attitude towards Christ. Patience, kindness, goodness as our attitude towards others. And faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control as our attitude toward ourself. To display all fruit every day requires the work of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. The fruit of the Spirit is a package deal. It's not like a buffet where you can pick a little love here and a little joy here, but leave gentleness and self-control to others. In verses 24 and 25, Paul teaches us how this works in real life. To those who belong to Christ Jesus, we have crucified the flesh Crucified is a past tense. 
But we also need to constantly crucify the flesh with its passions and desires to the cross on an ongoing action so that the flesh no longer reigns. If we live by the Spirit, we must walk by the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, when we submit to the Holy Spirit's work inside of us, we will bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is a character sketch of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you exercise faith in the person and finished works of Christ, you have victory over sin by faith because you are eternally saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. In verse 26, let us not be conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. The word conceited means to be empty of glory, desperate for recognition and affirmation to prove oneself, to be sure that we are always right. What you and I need is the recognition of God, the well done, good and faithful servant recognition from God. Provoking one another is the superiority complex competing with one another saying, I can beat you. In contrast, envying one another is the inferiority complex, comparing yourself to one another, saying, I can't beat you, but I hate you for it. Brothers and sisters, let me conclude by saying we should not be going into every situation comparing ourselves constantly, therefore going out to use and exploit people. Instead, we should always be going out into every situation looking for ways to serve and love one another. We must always yield to the Spirit of God, living our Christian freedom and glorifying the God who set you and I free from the yoke of slavery by loving our neighbors and walking by the Spirit. With that, let us close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message of loving others and walking by the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives in us, who shows the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for the fruit and setting us free and crushing the, slave, the, the chains of slavery to sin. Help us to daily remember because Jesus Christ has set us free. We are not to submit again to a yoke of slavery, to love our neighbors as ourselves, and to walk by the Spirit. Father, give us this daily desire to listen and to hear and abide by your word and your spirit. Help us to stand firm in the gospel in Christ and advance your kingdom and withstand any persecution for your sake in being identified with you. May we follow you with eager hearts, obedience to your work, to subdue the deeds of the flesh, and, and to enjoy the full fruit of the Spirit so that you may be honored. We thank you for the hope we have in Jesus. We love you, we praise you, and may our chief end always be to glorify you and enjoy you forever and ever. Amen.